Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar, Drivers for Cloud SCADA Operations, co-hosted by ISA and Honeywell. I'm Rob Briner with ISA and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items to go over and I also want to let you know how you can participate in today's session. First, poll questions and the question and answer session. There will be two poll questions within this webinar. When the poll questions pop up, please enter your answer into the poll feature on the right-hand side of your WebEx window. We will also have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. To submit your questions, type them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please do not use the chat toolbox for the Q&A session. If you have miscellaneous questions for me, though, you can submit those using the chat toolbox. If we do not get a chance to respond to your question, or if you would like to discuss a topic in more detail with the presenter, feel free to contact them directly. Their contact information will be provided at the end of the webinar. Second, for those of you who just joined, please make sure that you are on mute. If you would like to see the phone and audio broadcast connection instructions again, please refer to the confirmation email sent out to you today, or if you go to the top left-hand side of your WebEx screen, you will see a tab labeled Event Info. Connection instructions are included there as well. Additionally, once this webinar closes, a survey will pop up in your browser. Please take a few minutes to fill out this survey and tell us about your experience at today's webinar. All right, let's get started. Allow me to introduce our presenter. The presenter today is Pete Rollman, Senior Product Marketing Manager with Honeywell. Pete has over 20 years of experience in the oil and gas business, primarily focused on SCADA systems. He began his career engineering SCADA systems at an EPC firm and has since worked in sales and consulting roles dealing with IT, estimating, product development, and business level systems. More recently, he supported SCADA and compliance operations in a pipeline control center. Pete is currently a member of Honeywell's SCADA product team and is based in Houston, Texas. And now I will turn it over to you, Pete, to go over the agenda and get started with the webinar. Thanks, Rob. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. All right. Wait, waiting for the presenter. Status here. There it is. All right. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Rob. So I'll, we'll get uh, moving here. Thanks every uh, everybody for joining. Um, as Rob noted, the the topic that I was asked to talk about today has to do with drivers for 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 moving to a cloud SCADA operations. Uh, uh, system. Uh, and so in my agenda here, there's uh, four, uh, four sections that we'll cover that should take uh, uh, about a half hour or so to go through and, and leaving plenty of time for questions. Uh, so a real quick overview and some notes. Uh, we'll look at um, some of the changing scenarios uh, in industry that, that factor into to some of these decisions looking at, uh, uh, at cloud SCADA or drivers. Uh, challenges of a traditional on-premises SCADA system that then turn into solution drivers uh, for potentially moving to a cloud SCADA operation. Uh, and, and as Rob noted, uh, I've spent many years uh, working on and configuring SCADA systems, uh, and, and as with everybody else, we're, we're seeing quite a big push right now uh, into uh, cloud operations, and not just SCADA. There's other components of, of things that we offer at Honeywell as well as many people out there. Uh, that are beginning to move to the cloud. So a real quick overview here. So um, as noted in the title, um, I'm going to be highlighting business and technology drivers, uh, which would help push an end user to consider moving to a cloud-hosted type solution uh, for a SCADA system or even some other supporting systems. A lot of the talking points here uh, aren't strictly related to SCADA. There's also obviously talking points um, that we could talk on that that, as, that would push someone to not look to move to the cloud, right? All of these have to be balanced. And so um, this particular presentation isn't necessarily uh, getting into all of the pros and cons uh, of every one of these at this point. It's a far uh, a far longer conversation, but, but some of these will be touched on. Um, I'm also in this not trying to imply that 
uh, a cloud hosted solution is a fit for for every scenario out there. Um, you guys will all be thinking of questions, I'm sure, uh, if you haven't already, uh, that, that that come up as 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 why I would move or not move and put my data in the cloud or or put decision making in the cloud, and that's okay. Uh, and then lastly, cloud cloud hosted SCADA um, has been around for for quite a while, but it's uh, in 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 recent years it's becoming much more uh, attainable uh, within many industries. Almost any industry can do it, uh, and companies of all sizes uh, can get into it. So we'll, I'll I'll talk on a few uh, a few of those points there as well. All right, moving on. So my first uh, poll question here, and like Rob said, there'll be two uh, that just helps establish uh, uh, the audience a little bit here uh, and what you guys might have. So uh, if you could all answer uh, this quick poll question, uh, does your company that you currently work at utilize any cloud-hosted software solutions today? Right, so are you guys using anything? So you either have uh, really no idea and you're just using uh, software uh, as the company has given it to you to use, uh, or maybe you know there's at least one piece of software that you know doesn't run at your offices or, and it is hosted by others, and there could be more than one at that point. Um, and then lastly here, um, an option of don't really know uh, if we're using CloudScada, but I know we've been talking about it, and, and uh, uh, all indications are that, that, that we're potentially moving there in the future. So we'll wait a few seconds for uh, for those answers to come in, and I guess Rob, let me know when uh, uh, when that's complete. Yep, we got about got about half of our participants here. All right, um, I see some uh, results that, that came in, so I guess we'll consider that closed out. Um, uh, we had a, a handful of no answers, but uh, most of the others were there's at least one, um, or uh, not quite sure, but talking about it and, and probably moving there. And then a, a smaller count of, of don't really know, just because I have something to use and, and I use it, and that's, that's all fine as well. <clears throat> all right, thank you guys for, uh, for filling that out. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we'll, get, uh, we'll move on here. So looking at some of the changing scenarios, and so some of these um, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, in the past uh, that, that we'll cover here, but they all still are a, a factor into to making some of these decisions. And so the first one, and this one's a little focused on the energy industry versus things outside of that, um, but, but we definitely see a change in the mix um, uh, of the energy globally in supply and demand. And so that starts to drive a, a company that might be in that global uh, in that global side of things as to, to where they get their data, how do they access their data. Uh, and so then, you know, that, that's where the cloud starts to come into play. Uh, another, oops, move forward here. Uh, uh, another scenario is, is the shrinking pool of subject matter experts. So again, this is one of the ones I know that's been on the plate or the table for, for quite a while uh, as a large pool of resources start to retire. Uh, and what happens to that knowledge? How do we how do we retain that knowledge? And that the cloud doesn't necessarily solve that, uh, but but the cloud does become an avenue to to help solving that better. <clears throat> Third, uh, increasing government regulations. So uh, you know, in the pipeline industry and other oil and gas in, uh, industries, and then outside of that, usually when a when a regulation is put in place, it's there to stay, and and we have to deal with it. Uh, as end user customers uh, and even from the vendor side that I'm on uh, currently here. Uh, and there's a lot of focus on safety. So again, uh, start the gears turning on how can a, a cloud hosted type solution help help enable me to, to achieve that a little bit better. Fourth, uh, and always or and always an increased uh, focus on on expenditures, right? Whether it's capital or operational costs. And with 
some current technologies out there and advancements in software and the industrial Internet of Things, um, people are looking for improved uptime, more value for their money. What do I do with my aging assets that I have today and how do I prevent them from becoming aging tomorrow, right? Is there a way to prevent that? And, and finally, there's a fifth one here that, 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 that we drive to related to alternative solution outlets. And this is part of the changing scenario in where does this cloud come into play here? So the increase in availability globally, like I mentioned in the changing energy markets, right? I might have people all over the world that need access to things uh, quite a bit more than they did in the past. Uh, getting an improved security model from experts support and expertise from the vendor directly. We see in a lot of cases now where vendors are able to support their <clears throat> their field devices directly from these cloud-connected type systems. That's quite a change uh, over years past. And then hybrid solutions being an option. People don't want to jump in with both feet right away. So they're looking for some flexibility in how they, in, in how they get there. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> So then we so, so that's some some of the items related to to an industry focus that that might start think get you thinking and driving uh, towards a cloud solution. So now I'm going to show some some typical challenges that that we've seen historically uh, for for on-premises SCADA solutions, right? The traditional way of doing things, uh, and these aren't as much uh, a lot. Some of, there's technical challenges buried in this uh, to an extent, uh, but. There's three high-level buckets, if you will, um, that I've put these in here. So I have capital expenses uh, that go into an initial SCADA system. I've got operating expenses and technical resources and technical items that go on in the initial side of that project in the long-term maintenance, right? And then there's indirect costs that sometimes we, we, we often overlook uh, when we're looking at the pure costs of things and how much one versus the other costs, right? If, if there's downtime in your SCADA system or other, some other supporting system, what's the cost to that to, to some uh, parallel part of your business? And then time to market delays is another one that we see quite a bit here at Honeywell, that if we can get a project moving quicker, there's definite value in that, uh, and that indirect cost is, is kept low. So again, these are just a few high-level <clears throat> buckets that I'm going to uh, talk in a little bit of detail on these as we look at how, how these things affect the project. So looking at a traditional approach to the on-premises system and, and some of these challenges that, that, that we see that, are, that usually rise to the surface. So in, in the cost side of things, and this is focused at cost because that's where people uh, look at real numbers typically, uh, but there will be some things here we talk about that aren't necessarily cost related. Uh, so working from the bottom to the top, um, if I'm going to have an on-premises system, whether I'm a, a small company with a small system or a larger company in, in a larger system, I still have to have uh, space for this. And that's, again, that space, whether I put it in my office, uh, in, 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 a, in an empty office, or if I have something built out a little bit more proper in a data center, or if I'm actually still buying my own hardware and putting in a co-location type facility uh, and someone is managing that. I'm still paying for that uh, in a traditional sense of leasing that space. Uh, server and rack hardware itself, right? I've got to buy the servers. I've got to buy the rack hardware, networking components. Um, there's, there's obviously um, a lot more uh, when it comes to these larger systems related to only the SCADA components. And, and I'm not implying here that, that, uh, that this is really touching on every, every piece within a customer's network, but really focused on the SCADA components. So I've got that server hardware. I've got to provide power to this, and I've got to have backup power to this if I'm doing my job right, whether that's a localized UPS or I have some full generation facility uh, associated. There's money that goes with that. I've got to cool that space, and depending on where something is, sometimes heat that as well. There's money with that. I have to buy my software licenses, and I have to maintain those on premises as well. There's an effort there. I have software support that I have to maintain and work with the vendor on. Uh, we all know how that goes on a yearly basis sometimes. And then I have on-site labor resources that I have to pay for, whether, whether they're a direct hire to me supporting uh, some kind of IT infrastructure or hardware, or I'm contracting someone out to come fix something. They have to come in and do that and maintain that. A second set of items here, I, I call these hidden costs at times, uh, or operating and indirect costs. And, and although these look fairly obvious, 
um, we, we definitely see cases where a lot of times some of this isn't factored in when, when people are looking at uh, overall costs of systems. Uh, so working from top to bottom on this one, um, I've got a security concern, both cybersecurity and physical security, that if I'm hosting a system on premises, I've got to continually maintain that and monitor that, uh, there for that, the reliability of the system. What is the overall system reliability that, that again, I have to, I have to be the one that's got my eyes over that. And it's not that it's impossible, uh, but just pointing this out is something that, that does take time and effort to do that, which, which is a cost. Uh, what kind of flexibility do I have in my system? If I'm adding new servers, is it, do I have to add an entire server? What if I need to change memory? Uh, how, how flexible is my system in the in the server side of things, and then how flexible is my system in a communication side of things as well? And then the last uh, little bullet point there on that one, you know, what do I do with you know how flexible? How I got decommissioned servers that I got to go do something with now. On the hardware side, I've got refresh and upgrades to the physical hardware itself, right? So we've all been through this. I've got to I've got to buy new servers. I got to get those delivered. I've got to get them configured. I got to get them put into a rack, or if I'm just setting them in a corner, right? Uh, I have to do that, and I have to make the transition from old hardware to new hardware, uh, and sometimes that can be a quite a long, painful painful process. Um, the maintenance of this hardware and software, right? I have ongoing maintenance of that hardware. Uh, dealing with hardware failures, like I pointed out. Fans will fail, hard drives will fail, my UPS might fail. Again, I have to attack that in my premises uh, or bring somebody in to do that uh, all the time. Uh, and software maintenance has to do with just typical patches and upgrading of software and maintaining a current level of those. Um, I know that uh, I've, I've been on that side before as well of, of maintaining updates and patches to software, and it's 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 uh, quite an undertaking at times, and and many people tend to get behind on those, and then down the road, uh, that starts to have negative implications on how you can move your your system forward, and then tax implications. So I know tax uh, tax laws are different uh, in every country globally, but but here in the states, uh, in general, my my hardware that I purchase. Uh, I've got to depreciate that in my tax records over time, right? So there's there's something I have to do with this hardware I'm purchasing that is there potentially somehow for me to offload that. Uh, the time to implement my system, again, uh, this has to do with whether it's a new system or uh, uh, an addition to a system for, in, the, in this traditional sense, I've got to order hardware, it's got to be shipped, it's got to be installed, it's got to be configured, and, and that takes time. Uh, if I have an avenue that allows me to cut most of that out of the equation, there's some value with that for sure. And then lastly, the net present value of that capital expenditure, right? Could I be investing that somewhere else that might be making me more money or better interest uh, than buying these, these assets that depreciate over time uh, that I have to deal with? So again, those are just some of the, 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 the items that typically rise to the surface, obviously, um, uh, that's somewhat of an oversimplification of a uh, of a project or a system, uh, but uh, I think it's some really good uh, high points there. So these challenges that I listed there, and those again, those a lot of them are cost focused, and that's where a lot of people think. And not everything that's a driver for moving to the cloud is necessarily, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 100% cost. Um, but those challenges that I highlighted there, those are the things that start to turn into this baseline for what, what I would say is a new driver for tr transitioning um, to a cloud-hosted solution. So let's look at some of these now and how they start to fall out in that cloud-hosted type model. So I referenced the, the capital expenditure uh, side of things. So in a, a cloud-hosted type solution, and you might hear software as a service, um, which doesn't necessarily imply cloud all the time, but, but a lot of people related to that infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. Uh, a lot of these, most all of these are in an operational expenditure model, a subscription model that you pay for as you go with a little bit, there's some varying um, options in these. But it gives me what that does for me as, as a customer now is it gives me predictable monthly payments or outlays of cash that's going to uh, to my vendor versus capital expenditure spikes uh, that come in the way of milestone payments and, and many of those way up front. And then I also have a lower cost of entry into this SCADA system now. So what you'll start to see is many of these hosted type solutions, uh, we, we offer a, a small setup fee and then your system is ready to be configured and go in, in a matter of, of depending on what's going on of hours or, or days uh, with that subscription payment 
uh, kicking off. So much lower cost of entry, which enables uh, a, lot large, uh, a lot larger pool of end users that can actually take advantage of that. Okay, the hardware itself. So now I'm starting to eliminate some of my hardware ownership and the maintenance costs of dealing with all this hardware and as it gets older down the road. So again, I highlighted earlier um, the, some of the pains with upgrades and hardware failures that I might have on premises. So as I move to a cloud hosted model and I'm putting that burden on the hosting company, I've taken, I don't have that, that burden on me anymore of, of that ownership. Um, I also get rid of some, not all, it depends on the scenario, of the building space that I need, the power that I need to supply to this, the cooling requirement, all of this starts to decrease. It doesn't necessarily go away because I do have, I am going to have some networking components involved uh, in a larger network, uh, but, but depending on the size of my SCADA system, that's, those are lines on the, uh, on the data sheet that go away. And quicker instantiation of these new systems, whether it's in a, what we all understand is a, is a virtual machine type scenario in this cloud or more of a true native cloud uh, service where, where services are simply utilizing uh, larger, uh, larger cloud resources. I can get those up and going much quicker uh, in this uh, cloud hosted model. Uh, the software. So now when I have software that I'm paying a service to use, um, my software is going to be always kept up to date. It's always going to have the latest features and upgrades by the vendor or the cloud hosting provider. I don't have to remember to go do that anymore. Obviously, there's coordination goes on between cloud hosting provider and end user on when these upgrades would be done in, in SCADA systems. Obviously, for the critical nature of them, you, you know, nobody wants to uh, uh, introduce an outage when it doesn't need to be there. Um, the security updates and real-time monitoring of the system that's now hosted in the cloud. The combination of the cloud hosting provider and the vendor working together to provide a, uh, at times a much higher level of security than we might see in some, some on-premises systems. Not to say that it's a perfect fit every time, though. I have no licenses to manage anymore on-premises. I don't have dongles or files that I have to worry about and how many users do I have using it. That's all going to be help controlled by the vendor uh, that I'm working with now. And then the support in infrastructure. Now that I'm using a vendor that's in a cloud environment, they have a larger pool of, of subject matter experts that will be available to me uh, in that support model uh, to help solve problems on my system or improve things uh, as it grows. Uh, agility and flexibility uh, of a cloud system. So quicker system provisioning. I know I pointed that out in the past, but it, uh, that becomes a big deal uh, when, when systems, how quickly systems can be provisioned, and then if there is engineering work on it, that that can get started right away. I don't have to order the hardware, install, and configure it anymore. Uh, bandwidth and resource expansion uh, as the business needs it. So as my business grows, or if my business shrinks, if I sell off some asset, or I don't need the, the horsepower anymore, I can, I can have that scale back, which then directly uh, starts to change my subscription a little bit. But things like storage and memory and processing power, uh, again, the network bandwidth, new instances or, or removing those, all those can typically be done in an on-the-fly type, type nature there where, where you don't see an outage to, to change any of those. Streamlining uh, processes around system operations and worker productivity. That's a really big deal, obviously, uh, when workers in the field and having to move around. Everybody wants them to be as productive as they can. And if, and if you don't have to worry about this SCADA system anymore, there's focus that can be put on that. And then hybrid solutions, and I'll mention this more than once as well, um, that, that now would give you an option to move slowly to the cloud or the ability to keep critical type data on premises that you don't want to put up there in the cloud. Maybe you're not comfortable with it yet, or there's some government regulations. There's, there's hybrid models, as I call it here, uh, that allow me to take some of the non-critical data or diagnostic data and offload some of that to say to a, to a cloud SCADA solution that would interact with an on-premises system. Business competitiveness is a big deal in this. So once I have something in the cloud, I have already, I have increased collaboration across my sites, across networks. I have access anywhere. All controllable, however, right? It's just not, not, not a wide open system, uh, but it gives me those options now. I know many people have access to their systems today that they're hosting, obviously, so some of this isn't that big of a change, uh, but, but there are many people out there that, that don't have this ability today, uh, so it's a real eye opener. Um, with the cloud-hosted solution, I have access to enterprise-level solutions of things now. 
right, for any company. So if I'm a small company and I have access to a cloud-hosted solution, I'm able to play at the, on the same playing field as a bigger company, just on a smaller scale. I don't have to, 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 uh, uh, to, to cut corners um, because I had to buy all this software on premises and it's, and it gets expensive. Um, I'm, I'm able to act more quickly now with less resources, right? So I can help because I have a support model in the cloud infrastructure that's really kind of an extension uh, of my network and my resources. It allows me to, to work with less resources. As I pointed out, uh, smaller companies can compete with larger companies now. Um, I know uh, us uh, specifically, uh, we have cases where people are really watching some of these these cloud type movements and how it what it does to a smaller company and makes them more efficient. And when a larger company sees that a smaller company is doing something much better than them in some efficiencies and costs in other parts of the business, because they've moved to this cloud type model, that that really gets people thinking about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then all of this is leveraging uh, data center economies of scale. So the major providers, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, IBM, um, the, the size of their data center and the quantity of customers that they have, that's what really starts to drive down uh, a lot of these costs, as well as improvements in security and, and other models that are, that are always being improved in there. And I'll touch on some of that towards the end that uh, uh, related to private versus uh, public type scenarios. I'm going to move it on here. A few more here. Disaster recovery. Disaster recovery and business continuity is always a big topic, especially if you, if as as a as a business grows in, in whatever industry and, and controlling a process, uh, there's always a need to be able to control it from multiple locations, uh, multiple locations uh, potentially. And I can speak directly to that being here in Houston recently, and I'm sure anyone in in Florida is very similar in the sense of. Uh, of buildings that had to be shut down during the recent floods and, and people moved out of that buildings and you don't have access to it anymore. So now these, these cloud hosted solutions are off premises and they're in purpose built facilities that are also typically built in strategic locations to help defend against any kind of natural disaster. Uh, the, on top of that, uh, again, being that they're, most of these are purpose built, uh, they're, they're prepared for hardware and software failures, right? So my data that I'm storing up there, uh, I know that if, if hardware fails, they've got systems in place to, to, to deflect that, that influence on my system, uh, as well as having cross-site backup and resource utilization. So most of these, again, the majors, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they've got many data centers out and about. And so I have the ability to move my, my system from one data center to another in a, in a paired type uh, scenario. It's, it's typically part of a standard solution offering uh, that you get when, when you're working with a vendor on this. <clears throat> uh, and so that, that really goes to help what, what could happen to a system if your local uh, uh, site has issues. And again, there's a lot of other variables on the premises and on site side of things that have to be taken into account in the overall architecture. There's, there's not just a magic silver bullet that, that, that makes all of your data accessible no matter what happens. Uh, but, but that would be the case for any system, whether it's being configured on premises in, in a network there or, or utilizing the cloud. <clears throat> the maintenance uh, of your system now. So now the cloud provider is dealing with hardware and the maintenance of that hardware, right? Again, I pointed that out earlier of not having to deal with upgrades and failures. They're, they're maintaining that uh, behind the scenes. I don't have to worry about it anymore. The maintenance of the software uh, and even the system configuration and upkeep itself as as you as you need it changed is typically part of these solutions, right? So again, I mentioned it earlier. Um, this this idea that that the vendor I'm working with becomes an extension of my team uh, to an extent uh, is is a is a carries some some pretty some good weight in in how that can help me out. Uh, and then again, the global pool of qualified resources available. Um, for support and engineering needs. I can put, so at Honeywell now, I can put the, the, the exact person's right eyes on the issue or, or the, the task at hand uh, that needs to be done. Again, all within a secure environment, and, and, and that's a whole other, another conversation uh, uh, that, that, that doesn't take place here today. And then speaking of that, security and compliance. Security is usually one of the top items that's discussed uh, in moving to a cloud infrastructure, and everybody has a little bit different requirements. Uh, but then there's obviously uh, a lot of government regulations that are in place um, that, that not only have has someone like Honeywell look to 
uh, make our solution compliant with, but the, the vendor that we use to help host all of this data also complies with these, among many other uh, requirements for this hosting industry and the security of data that's moving and that it's at, and, and at rest uh, as well. Um, but if you bullet points here on security and compliance, um, sometimes it's, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow, but we've seen where the security that we can provide in a cloud solution is, is at times uh, above and beyond what an on-premises solution is providing. So even though that on-premises solution, we, we can go touch the servers and feel them and it's behind our own closed doors and we have our firewall, <clears throat> we have our antivirus, we have measures in place, uh, but the way how often I monitor that uh, and how well I upkeep that and make sure things are there um, for uh, it's obviously with larger companies, there's more resources to handle that, but as you move down the size of company scale there, mid to small size companies, <clears throat> excuse me, those resources uh, at times become a little bit thinner to maintain that. And so uh, a cloud hosted solution can provide a much better layer of security there long term. Uh, the real time intrusion monitoring, reporting and action, again, uh, that's something that, that uh, these, these cloud providers are, they're in this to keep your data secure, they wouldn't be getting business, right? Um, so, so they're doing that all the time. And then the physical separation is something that people don't think about sometimes. And again, this depends on the customer, you know, the end user and, and, and where you might have something. Uh, but I've seen many cases and been part of companies where our, our SCADA servers and other servers are sitting in a place where somebody visiting can physically go to that thing at times, right? And, and, and maybe that was uh, by chance or, or somebody forgot to lock a door uh, or close the door. Uh, but now that this, in this cloud-hosted environment, I'm removing that physical temptation away from, from a customer that comes in or a contractor that comes in, or my own employees for that matter, right? Nobody's going to go stick a USB uh, a thumb drive in my server now because it's not even here. <clears throat> And, and the last uh, slide here on, on these solution drivers is there's already existing cloud systems that like the question I had asked at the beginning um, that, that many, many, many companies are using nowadays already and many people don't even realize it. And not that uh, necessarily that any of these systems uh, uh, are gonna tie into a SCADA system. Some of them will. Um, we've done some advanced things in time financials into a SCADA system to help make better, make better operational decisions on a system, but a lot of these are moving to the cloud. So the financial systems and payroll are, are, are all moving to the cloud. My order management systems, my enterprise resource, my enterprise resource planning systems. Um, I've seen a lot of GIS systems being utilized within companies that all of their GIS data for their assets is, is hosted uh, by a company that uh, that provides that via a browser to them. It's not on my premises anymore, and I'm trusting them with that data uh, that I can then use for reference or integrate into my SCADA system. And then other government reporting uh, programs and issues are, are, are all starting to be cloud-driven now. Uh, versus uh, filling out a form and, and sending it in type of thing. So there's a lot of things existing that, that still many people haven't wrapped their head around that that, that is cloud hosted today. <clears throat> and lastly, SCADA itself um, has been using cloud providers, uh, if you will, for, for quite some time now. So any kind of communication network in the in modern times, uh, I, don't, I don't typically, I'm not gonna own the fiber a lot of times uh, or the cell system or the satellite system for that matter. So I'm using cell providers and satellite companies that are getting my data from point A to point B and point C um, that's using their, their internet backbone, right? So, so networks such as AT&T and Verizon, I'm able to, to get a private tunnel, encrypted tunnel within there, but I'm using their, their internet backbone to get my data from point A to point B. So I'm already relying on some of this with my on-premises data, uh, data center. I still have to make those connections out to my field or to my manufacturing uh, facilities, and, and I definitely don't own that network infrastructure to do that. And in corporate WANs is another point, right? Buildings are connected through corporate WANs, and those are, those are using private, <clears throat> excuse me, private connection paths via some of these companies like Verizon and, and, and AT&T or even uh, satellite. <clears throat> and then remote data centers and remote operation centers, obviously, um, uh, at these co-location facilities are, are using those to get, get out as well. So it's something that's already there, and, and we in the SCADA business have been doing that for a long time, so it's not that big a stretch to think of, of moving. Uh, instead of having my server sitting in my office, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move them somewhere else and deal with that network connectivity almost in the exact same way that I have to deal with it uh, when I host it myself. 
but I now have offloaded uh, uh, some of that burden and work to the, to the cloud provider. <clears throat> so how does this look kind of back to the visual that I put together earlier uh, with the CapEx and the hidden costs? So as we move, uh, and this is so this is kind of revisiting the, the slides I just went through from the traditional approach to a system to a hosted solution, uh, these, these, these CapEx costs that I have start to collapse into my operational uh, expenditure cost. And so I have all of my hardware components, the cooling, the power, and backup power, my servers themselves and rack hardware, and then the physical space that collapses into the data center hosting and support side of things. My software licenses and support, I'm no longer having to handle and deal with all my software licenses back and forth uh, with a vendor. That's all going to be contained in that subscription subscription type model uh, that I'm paying for to get access to in the cloud and I'm letting them uh, take care of, of how that works and working in conjunction with me and my needs. Uh, and then my on-site labor resources. Now I might simply be able to use uh, the existing IT resources or other SCADA or engineering resources. I kind of lumped it into just saying IT at this point. Um, but I'm, I'm able to use those existing resources now. Uh, I don't have to add to that to handle uh, what I'm adding. And then secondly here, that other uh, bucket of items, again, from the security, the reliability, the hardware refresh work that goes on and upgrades, maintenance of that hardware and software. On the tax side, I'm not buying this hardware anymore. It's I'm, when I'm simply paying as I use it. Uh, and then the time to implement, again, it all starts to collapse into this operational expenditure that I'm working with my vendor uh, on now. And then lastly, that net present value item, again, can I take that, that, that large capital expenditure that I might have to outlay and do I have a better, a better bucket to put that in? Um, now, again, so I might be reinvesting that same money and spending it still, right? Uh, but it gives me some options on where that gets spent versus uh, versus this SCADA system here. And so some final thoughts on all that, and I know that was that, that was all pretty high level, and, and obviously uh, as you peel back the onion on some of these, there's a lot of talking points in there, but again, these are the things that kind of float to the surface on what would drive someone to start looking at a cloud-hosted solution. Um, but, but any company, end user, has to evaluate these options and determine if it's going to be a fit for your company. Again, I pointed out at the beginning, um, you can jump both feet in, but it's not necessarily a fit all the time, and then there's a lot of questions that come up. The cybersecurity evaluations for the solution, again, that's something that's always going to be required to make sure that, that, that you as the customer are comfortable, and I want to be co comfortable as the vendor as well. Uh, but there, there's all those items that have to go on through a cybersecurity. The public cloud versus private cloud implementation comparison. So we hear a lot about private clouds because, again, that starts to allow a company to keep their data uh, localized within their network still. It's a private cloud. But there's cost implications with that. I'm starting to buy some of that hardware again. So, again, all of that has to be balanced uh, versus using a public cloud type solution, which at times is, is looked at uh, being less secure, but, but there's arguments that, that, that can show it's almost just as secure. Uh, a gradual move to a hosted solution. It doesn't have to be all at once if you don't want it to be. There are ways to get there in a, in a slower fashion, in a gradual fashion. Uh, the critical versus non-critical data location, right? There, we've had many people that say, I don't want people touching this. I don't, or, I don't want the ability or even the thought that, that this, the ability to touch this from the cloud is there. So I want to keep that here. But I do have all of this other data that's coming out of my assets that I'm, I'm okay with, with moving that on and having uh, a, you know, a one-way interaction between some of these things. So all of that stuff has to be considered. Um, when, when a company starts moving things to the cloud, and, and you would have seen this in some of the software packages I pointed out that are in use today, there's a change in IT and, and users and management processes that, that, that does take some time sometimes, right? Um, and not to say that it's necessarily painful, uh, but it's different and, it, and, you know, just people have to get used to a, a change in where things are and how they interact with things. Uh, importantly, you're, you're signing up with a cloud provider, right? Uh, you're, you're signing up with, with Honeywell to become, a, as a vendor, um, that we become part of your business. We're, we're more of a partner at that point because we want your, your system to succeed. So, so we're going to do our best to make sure ours succeeds. Uh, so that's, that's something that, that has to take on some, uh, some consideration. Uh, 
And then lastly, you know, again, the cloud hosted solution is always a fit. Um, so, so it might sound like it's great and you're being pushed in that direction, uh, but that's where all of these, these and many more actually uh, come into play in, in evaluating where that is a fit. And, and, and again, the, and lastly here, the, the leaps and bounds that have happened with these uh, cloud providers uh, and, and even to the extent that it's allowed Honeywell uh, on the Honeywell side extent, our internal, we have two internal uh, clouds that we have for internal development. And that is that has really blossomed over the years with with technology, uh, but but these these services are, are just so much more readily available nowadays uh, to any company that wants to get into it. There's 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 a plan out there uh, to jump in, and then it's it's always improving uh, as uh, as as the masses get bigger, uh, getting into these um, the cloud hosting providers and vendors like us uh, are really really driving for uh, for improved solutions. Uh, and it's it's pretty interesting, uh, to say the least. So I think that uh, leads us. Uh, that's the uh, the last slide. And so I have uh, before we start the Q and A, I have uh, one more uh, poll question. So Rob, if uh, uh, if you could start that poll, uh, which item below of the the four that are there do you think uh, might be the biggest internal talking point at your company? So if your company hasn't made a move to the cloud yet, uh, or or talking about it, so of these four, and there's many more than this, obviously, um, but but which of these four is uh, do you guys think would be the biggest talking point in your company? The overall cost changes, right? Is it really just a cost play um, that you're looking for? That I can see that the um, you know since I move into this OpEx model, my my costs are going to go down. Now, long term, um, these things start to equalize to some extent, um, but there's a lot to be said for the subscription model of things, and and making sure you bring into account all of the things that go into the cost, uh, those hidden costs such as hiring people and maintaining things? Or is it the data and cybersecurity that goes on? You're not as worried about cost. It's more, you know, that data has to be secure uh, up there, and I'm not worried about the cost. I'll pay anything to do it uh, type of thing. Um, the business competitive side of it, right, is, is that might be a more of a driving uh driving nature and if you so if you're a small company how do I become more competitive with my larger competitors or if I'm a large company I've got to how do I how do I be more competitive which in turn is bringing down my costs or is it just the pure flexibility if I think of the hybrid solutions uh, you know what what is is that going to be the biggest talking point uh, in there so again these were just four of the the main ones I picked out that, that I'm curious to see what some of the feedback is um, uh, related to the audience on what they think might be, um, and I should I guess I could have should have put a other uh, in there. And then once this is complete, uh, we'll we'll move on to any uh, Q and A that uh, that anyone might think of. So I'll, uh, as, as we're waiting on that, I see there's a, a comment, a question slash comment in here from, from Ronald. Um, uh, talk, where'd it go? So data and security in the, in the poll is the, uh, um, the, the winner there. So that's, that's not uncommon um, because everyone's worried about their data. That's for sure. So that's, uh, that's good. Um, so on the Q&A, so Rob, I don't know if you want me to just jump into this one that's there. I mean, that, that's fine. Uh, or if you some other one. Okay, so so Ronald asks, or he makes a comment about covering um, unusual issues and incentives for moving towards the cloud. Um, uh, how to use the cloud with unique requirements to skate any real-time issues and control issues. So so that kind of specific to more of a technical solution, right? So again, um, when I think of moving something, a, a SCADA server, if you will, to the cloud, from an on-premises to the cloud, and making those network connections to end devices. Uh, for the for the near real time data, uh, again the the bandwidth that I have from my my cloud data center to end devices, whether that's through um, uh, VPN connections to a customer's corporate network or directly to end devices through a telco, for instance, right, or VSAT, um, 
the, the bandwidth that I have to get that, that near real-time data back and forth and be able to output data um, is, is the same almost every time that it's going to be from, a, from an on-premises data center that's using those same uh, network resources to get from point A to point B. Uh, obviously, if, if, uh, if somebody has, for instance, laid their own fiber uh, from point A to point B and it's their fiber, um, they're, they're going to have uh, uh, quite a bit more control over that uh, over that real time type issue there, uh, but when when doing this um, uh, real time data back and forth uh, from end devices in a field or facilities, um, you really wouldn't expect to see uh, any degradation uh, in that. Now the control issues, right? Uh, to touch on that quickly, um, we we want to make sure that we separate uh, what we define what we mean by control in this, right? So in a SCADA system. Uh, I, I am not doing, uh, typically, right, I've, I've seen it done before, but I'm not doing control, so to speak, the, the control algorithms themselves. I'm not performing that within my software uh, to then make the decisions for uh, a piece of equipment in the field. I'm going to have something in the field um, that's going to have a CPU and a brain and a control algorithm uh, that's going to control uh, that device in the field. And so if I lose connectivity, uh, from my SCADA system, again, whether it's on-premises or in cloud, um, that, that field unit, that site uh, is still going to have its local control, whether it's a, uh, a computer-based uh, type control or, or physical control to shut down something. Uh, so, uh, so I apologize, I didn't uh, dive into SCADA-specific points on, on how that works, but this was really focused at well, what, what starts to drive me to look at moving to that cloud, but, but you're correct. Um, uh, bandwidth and, and data connectivities are all part of that that end solution. But uh, but again, from 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 my experience and, and having done it and used them and, and looking at architecting them, uh, moving from one data center to another um, doesn't doesn't change much uh, in the sense of, of of my bandwidth and that and that real time SCADA issue or uh, real time data uh, that's going back and forth. All right, thank you, Pete. Yes, um, I am going to uh, open the floor for questions now. Um, you can um, enter your questions down in the Q&A box here on the right side of your screen. Uh, Pete, as you said, you saw that first one there, and so um, just submit them down here. Um, we did have another one come in a different way. I have a question I see here. It, yeah. It says in um, internet connectivity. Yes, yeah. right there. In yep. Internet connectivity is important for cloud SCADA systems. Um, if connectivity fails for a long time, then what will be redundancy for it? Correct. So that, that's that's correct. So um, the the redundancy. So if I lose connectivity to a site, whether you know, obviously the the inner there's a lot of hops that go on in between point A and point B. Um, again, I, I stress between. Your local, your data center that you have versus the cloud getting to that same endpoint, yours is going through just as many hops, and there's just as many points of failure at times uh, that can happen between those once you're stepping out into some other uh, some other vendor's network uh, to get there. So then obviously there's things that you can do uh, related to uh, data path redundancy, right? I can have multiple data paths uh, to a site, and I can, like I pointed out earlier, uh, I can have I can have configurations in multiple data centers. So if data center A has issues, uh, I could always look to fail over to data center B and, and see if that resolves my connectivity issue as that's being troubleshoot, uh, troubleshooted. Uh, but again, it's, it's not too far different um, uh, versus what you would have to deal with today uh, in a traditional SCADA system on if a data path fails. Um, again, I know uh, coming coming from the pipeline I worked for, you know, we, we would have, you know, data connectivity issues that had to be troubleshooted, some depending on the, the criticality of a site. Um, you might only have one path to that site or you might have two or more to that site. Uh, and then you would use those multiple paths to get to that site and, and troubleshoot that issues. And even to the point of having to fail over um, to a backup, um, a, a backup data center somewhere. Uh, for some period of time, which obviously then kicks in all sorts of other uh, manual processes that have to go on and and reporting. So I don't know if that that answers your question at all, um, Shalindra, there or, or not. Okay. Well, thank you, Pete. Um, uh, looks like we had a couple more coming in here. Oh, yeah. Try to get this up here. It won't let me make so, it bigger. Um, let me read this one out for you, Pete. Um, yeah, I'm trying to get it bigger here. And it won't. 
I'm sure you can see it as well, but um, we've had problems where data in the cloud is not made available to software on our local network due to licensing restrictions of the cloud software. Is that a common issue? Uh, is that in here somewhere? That is down in the Q&A box. In the q uh, I do not see that. It might have gone to you maybe. The last one I see is the, the connectivity and redundancy one. And Q and A. Okay. No. I don't see it. So can you read that again? I, I just don't have it to read. Of course, no problem. Um so uh the uh, the individual that's writing this said, we have had problems where data in the cloud is not made available to software on our local network due to licensing restrictions of the cloud software. Is that a common issue? Um, I, I personally haven't seen it as a common issue. That sounds like that's that's purely um, an issue with uh, with the cloud vendor, with the software vendor in the cloud and what they're going to allow you to do with the data. Um, I, I have seen that. I mean, we haven't here run into that problem because we, we don't want that to be a, a, a burden, right? We, I don't want to, to get in the way of a customer using their data. Um, but I do know of cases where um, some of uh, uh, the – I've seen cloud vendors be restrictive uh, on the use of the data that they have. Um, and so, yes, it, it, it's out there. Um, could it be potentially a, uh, a – a, um, the, the the type of service you're paying for, um, you know, a the, the low end type service gets you this data and it has to reside there. Um, but but if you're on a different tier or subscription um, that, that you would usually cost more money, they would allow you to have access to data. It might be something as simple as, as that as well. Um, and back to real quick, uh, Shalindra, uh, I see you had the last bullet item on your question there about um, in India internet connectivity being a big issue, and and that's part of this. This, this challenge, right? If internet connectivity is an issue, it's gonna be hard to sell a cloud-hosted solution uh, to someone there. And so until that is resolved, because the cloud itself isn't gonna resolve that, um, but, but, but I would suspect, again, depending on what this particular system is serving, if internet connectivity is an issue, I would suspect that you're gonna see connectivity issues from time to time even within this, the, the traditional on-premises system, if it's having to reach out of, of point A to get to point B um, through some connectivity path that's utilizing that, 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 uh, uh, that internet infrastructure uh, there. But, but it could very well be it's okay in one region, uh, but a data center that I would use is in another region, and, and that's where the problem comes into play. And again, that obviously gets a little bit trickier once you start introducing um, uh, you know, pure internet connectivity problems to my to a cloud data center. Um, I would suspect that that cloud data center and that provider itself wouldn't be in business for very long um, if they couldn't help shore up or improve uh, that internet connection. All right, thank you. Um, looks like I've got another question that just came in here. Uh, it says, is there a product which stores temporary data then synchronizes with the cloud? So there's, 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 there's many out there that, that do that in, in varying forms. And so putting, uh, speaking from my, my Honeywell perspective, we, part of, of some of our solutions and not trying to make this into a sales pitch, but just on a technical front. Um, we, we have solutions in place where uh, an end device um, that is not always connected, and I don't know if you're, you're thinking of an end device type data transfer to the cloud, uh, which then is consumed by uh, the end users from the cloud interface. Um, we have devices that aren't connected all the time, and so they'll do their, their localized, you know, on-site or, or ground-based type activities uh, collecting data from from wherever and in storing that historically, if you will, um, locally to that device, uh, and then when 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 I reinterrogate the, that device from the cloud, um, I'm going to establish that it's got data that it's stored for me, uh, and then we're gonna the 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 cloud software and the end device there uh, will communicate to to pull that data back up into my uh, uh, into my cloud database, uh, and it's in a similar fashion where where we have always connected. Uh, type devices, so I, always, I have an open tunnel, an open path to this end device, and so it's a little bit more real-time data transfer, but if I ever lose that connection, that device is, is going to kick in. Um, it's going to see that connection is lost as well and kick into storing that data, uh, and again, obviously, there is some limit if it was 
you know, months and months and months of data disconnect, you're gonna you're gonna run out of some of that local space. But um, you usually don't see that that kind of timing. Uh, and when that data connection comes back, whether it's on its own or or somebody had to do something, uh, again, a similar type uh, interaction happens between server and client. And, and then all that data is transferred uh, over some period of time, right? The, the, the larger amount of data that's, that has been stored locally, uh, the larger chunk of data that is, the longer it's gonna take to, to backfill and bring that data back into my, my SCADA server. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, I see a couple of other questions coming in now. Um, let, let's, we may be able to answer one more. I know we have a hard out here at uh, the top of the hour. Um, but of course, uh, all attendees, you will uh, have Pete's contact information afterwards, if you, and it's there on the screen as well if you want to reach out to him directly. I'll also, um, our system will capture a record of all of the questions we have in the system, so I'll be getting those over to him um, to address directly. Um, but with about five minutes left here, I think I'm just going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, I can let me. I can do one quick, one last one there, real quick. The, uh, there's a question about patch management of systems in the cloud. Um, so, okay. from from my perspective at Honeywell, when when we're hosting um, the software, which we have a, a very large portfolio, obviously, um, us as the vendor in that case, working with with you, the customer, we we would do the patch management on on these software packages. That that's part of our service to you. Uh, is how we've outlined this. And again, obviously, it's not something that would just happen out of the blue um, because some, depending on what the patch is, might require a, a reboot or a recycle of some service. Um, so there's a management of change process that would go on to set up timing for uh, patch installation, if you will. Uh, but, but we would manage that. We as the vendor would manage that. And again, that's part of the, uh, uh, part of the cloud offering is that we're offloading that uh, from the end user customer. And then lastly, real quick, we, we do have scenarios though um, that have come up where a customer really wants to do it themselves. They have the personnel. I just I, I just want to offload some of this hardware and, and some of that work to the cloud, uh, but I have resources that can do do our own configuration and work. And, and so that's something that we would work with the customer on on how that, but, but we as hosting the software uh, really tr strive to be the ones that keep up the patches. So, so we're managing a, a consistent level of software across m multiple customers. Excellent, thank you, Pete. Um, just as a thank you to everyone, these have been some really great questions. We appreciate your participation here. Um, if you missed any portion of this webinar, if you would like to watch the recorded version, we will be emailing all registrants a link to the recording, along with additional links for supporting information. So uh, be on the lookout for an email from me in the next couple of days. Uh, as a reminder, once this webinar closes, a survey will pop up in your browser. So please take a few minutes to fill out this survey and tell us about your experience at today's webinar. This concludes the Drivers for Cloud SCADA Operations webinar. Thank you for attending. Uh, we hope you all acquired some useful information and look forward to seeing you again at one of our future webinars.